All right, so let's talk about trauma. All right, so those are congenital things, things that you were born with, so to say, or at least perinatal. All right, so trauma. All right, um, concussion. This is the most common brain injury. All right, this is what we're going to have is a violent blow to the brain or a sudden stop. But when this happens, there's nothing, we can't find any kind of uh, disease. There's nothing we can see in the brain that something went wrong. Okay? About 10% of people do lose consciousness over here, but there's no physical defect. So we call this a concussion. You could have mild, but you could have many symptoms, but when you look at the brain, there's nothing there. There's no bruising, there's nothing there. You have mild symptoms like headache, amnesia, confusion, drowsiness. What we're concerned about is these major symptoms. These are the ones you've got to take them to the hospital for. All right? Things you have nausea and vomit, convulsions, weakness on one side, unequal pupils. These are all saying things that something's happening in the brain. It's a trouble walking. Okay? So they must be watched because the thing is, we don't see at this time that it's a concussion. We don't know what it is at this time. We need to make sure that it's just a concussion and send them home. But is there something we're going to talk about? Maybe there's bloodshed and maybe blood is coming out. We have to, we have to watch them and see what's happening. All right, we'll talk about hemosolomy. Um, <clears throat> then we have contusions. Contusions are basically the same thing. However, there is a defect there, and it's usually bruising. Okay? So we see bruising to the brain, but it can be caused by you know, sudden stop um, or you know, someone blow to the head, right? It's boxing and stuff, um, or an impact of the skull. You get severe brain damage, and it will increase the intracranial pressure, um, and we have two different types. We have coop. Coop is actually, if someone pushes my head really hard against a brick wall, which many of you probably want me to do after this exam I gave you, right? No? Okay. But you push my head, like you whack it right against the, the brick wall. Now there's two things that are going to happen here. There's going to be my brain that's going to hit the impact. So my frontal lobe of my brain is going to have bruising there because it hit the brain, it hit the, the frontal skull or the skull bone, right? But there's also a rebound that happens. It hits there and goes backwards, right? In that case, you're going to also see, maybe, you may see another thing happening on the opposite side of where the impact was. We call that a contra coup. And in that case, the lesion is on the opposite side. And it's usually this rebound. So it hits the front, bam, it hits the back. Okay? Um, I'm showing a picture of it here, but this picture here, again, the brain goes forward and you may get something in the front here, but then as soon as it hits this, it goes backwards. And now you can have bruising that happens in the back. that tells you how forceful the blow was. Again, we're forensics, right? So uh, meninges, all right? So these are coverings around the brain, around the spinal cord. So think of, again, you need to understand what the central nervous system is. Brain and spinal cord. It's not just the brain, it's also around the spinal cord. So we have three separate ones, right? We've got the dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater going from outer to inner. So you have the skull first, and then this dura mater. And if you remember dissecting the, uh, oops, sorry. When you dissecting the, uh, the brains when you were in a and one or two, um, it was this, it really means tough mother. You can't really tear it. You have to cut it. It's very tough. But that's what that is up there. You have the arachnoid, which is web-like, like arachnophobia, right? Arachno means spider. And then the pia mater is actually um, a very thin layer that's, basically sticking to the brain and spinal cord. You really can't peel it off, okay? But then we have spaces in between. So we have something called the subarachnoid space. That's the space that's going to be between the arachnoid and the pia mater. Does the name help you? Does that make sense? Can you figure it out, right? This is the space is where the cerebral spinal fluid is going to sit. It's going to sit in the subarachnoid space. Now, we also have two other spaces that are pretty important to know. Dealing with the dura mater. We could have one below it, called what? What space is that called? Subdural, right? So you have a subdural space, 
And then the one above it is called the epidermis plate, right? But now it makes it, right, epi, like epidermis is going to be a higher level than the dermis, right? Same thing here, dura mater, you're going to have the epidural, you'll have the subdural. Now things should start making sense. Oh, I had a baby and I had an epidural. Oh, so what's going to happen here is that they're going to put medication. Now think of this, because some of you want to be nurse anesthetists too, right? So what's going to happen here is this. You're going to be putting a needle in the back. Okay? And you want to put medication there. You're not going to draw fluid from the epidural space. You're going to actually put medication there so that they're numb from the waist down. Okay? Now, you put the needle in, in the back, right? The lumbar puncture or epidural. You put it back there. And when you, when you put it through there, all of a sudden, fluid is coming out. Cerebral spinal fluid. Does that mean you hit the spot you were supposed to? You went too deep? Or you got to go in further? Think of where the cerebral spinal fluid is located. Cerebral spinal fluid. So if, the cere if you push it in and fluid is coming out, what area, what space did you hit? Subarachnoid. Where is that located? Right here. So my question is, you went in like this, and we got to go to the epidural space. So am I going to say, this is where I'm putting the medication? Do I got to go in deeper, or I got to pull back? Pull back. You see how you're using this? So as soon as you see the fluid, you know that you went too far. Just pull back a little, and that's where you put the medication. You don't want to put the medication down in this area here. It's too close to the damn spinal cord. You don't want to put a needle into the spinal cord. You don't want to put medication on the spinal cord. It's going to be too strong. So that's what's going to happen. You've got to pull back and give the epidural. Okay? So this is just showing you the layers. So there's the skull, there's the dura mater, there's your arachnoid layer, there's the subarachnoid, there's the pia mater, and then this is your brain, right? This is your you know, gray matter and white matter. And this is showing the same thing, okay? Now let's talk about hematomas, okay? Collections of blood that can happen in these potential spaces. So we could have an epidural hematoma. This is a, a blood collection that's going to happen above the, above the dura mater, okay? This usually is pretty drastic. It's usually a big blow to the head, like a bat to the head, baseball bat. And it usually cracks the skull, and underneath the, the place, uh, usually above the, the temporal uh, the temporal skull bone, there's a fracture there, but right underneath it is usually the middle meningeal artery. It's an artery. So think about it. What has more pressure, blood pressure, an artery or a vein? Um, artery, right? If I cut an artery, mm -hmm. I cut a vein, mm -hmm. it's kind of tricky, right? So. This is going to collect blood quite rapidly, okay? So this is one we got to really uh, stress about. Now what happens here, it's a fast bleed because it's an artery. They will usually go unconscious for a few seconds. A blow to the head, you, and then about 10 or 20 seconds later, you wake up. And a lot of times they say, oh, I'm okay, and they start walking. They're in this what we call lucid interval. They're awake for a number of hours because the blood from the blood vessel is actually going to start filling up this place. Rapidly, but over a amount of seven to eight hours or so. Enough where, where that blood is, that hematoma is going to start collecting. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It starts pressing on the, the cerebrum. And when it presses on there, inside you've got the midbrain. The midbrain is the upper portion of the brain stem that keeps you alert and awake. Well, if that gets compressed from all this blood that's compressing the cerebrum, now that's going to get compromised, and you could go into a coma. So you have this, what we call, lucid period. You're awake for a number of hours, but we've got to watch you to see if you go unconscious again. Okay? So I don't want people to keep 
Like the, like if not, right well, it's not that you don't want them sleeping. It's going to happen anyway. You know how, like, I, you're asking about the movies where they say, don't go to sleep. i got to stay with them so they don't go to sleep. If they're going to go to sleep because of this, they're going to just go to sleep. Trying to keep them awake is not going to solve this issue. The blood is still building up. I don't even know. I agree with you. I don't know where that came from. That the, do you know anything about that? Where, to stay awake? To, yeah, you see it in the movies. Don't go to sleep. You've got to keep you awake. Yeah. I don't know where oh. that came from. That doesn't maybe if you're sleeping, you don't know if you're sleeping or unconscious. Maybe you can see signs and see it from something. Yeah, maybe I don't. Yeah. yeah, but the maybe movies do that a lot. They want to like keep you awake, yeah. and yeah. It, it, this is what's going to happen. It's going to happen. So if they go to sleep, you need to go and get you know some help. All right. So that's where that comes in. If they don't have surgery, put a hole over here and draw up that blood, that growing. Well, I wouldn't call it, well, it's a tumor, but it's, it's a blood tumor. You don't want that growing tumor to be pressing on anymore. You're going to have to drill a hole here, bore a hole into the skull, and get that blood out. And that's what happens with that. So, uh, And what happens on a CT scan, I'll show you what it looks like. They usually have a classic biconvex pattern. Okay, You'll see what that looks like. This is a skull over here. And they usually get this, it's convex here and convex here. As opposed to concave. A concave, it looks like that. It's convex, concave there and concave there. But they usually get this. And I'll show you a picture so it makes sense to what that is. Okay? Um, so that's an epidural hematoma. And it's because of an artery that got severed. Then we have a subdural hematoma. And this is when many bridging veins get severed. Now, this is interesting. You have these bridging veins that kind of go up through here, and they go through the skull. So this is going to happen to someone who has a lot of falls, like an alcoholic, elderly. And what happens is those bridging veins will kind of like go forward, and the skull will actually cut those, those veins. Now, there isn't much pressure there, so it's going to take a long time for it to, to fill up. A lot of times, it's not just one fall, it's many falls because the blood coagulates. because It's such a slow bleed. So it's many, many times that they're going to fall down. Eventually, it's going to lead to this uh, subdural hematoma that's going to actually put them in a coma. And what they end up getting, and this is where shaking baby syndrome also happens too. All right, you shake this, you're making that those bridging veins get serrated, get cut right by the, the skull. So you'll get this. So shaking baby syndrome, there's a lot of things. It depends on the situation. It could be contusions, it could be concussions could be the subdural hematoma, all that kind of stuff. They usually get, if this is your brain over here, they usually get a, a crescent pattern, kind of this kind of setup, like a sickle that happens like that. Okay? I'll show you what those pictures look like. All right? So this is kind of like what I just drew for you. You have here the epidural hematoma. See how it looks like a biconvex, right? And there's usually a skull crack right there, okay? This is due to an artery. But then you have this situation over here. It's more of a crescent. This is a subdural hematoma. So because this is happening above, and this is the other thing to look out too, because it's happening above this, the dura mater, the blood is not going through these crevices, which are called sulci. But if it happens below the subdural, I mean below the dura mater, they do go into these sulci. You see that? That's another thing that you can see. Not so quite easily seen on a CT scan, but if it's shown like that, you could actually pick those up. Okay? So this is the CT scan. See how this is biconvex? Right? But over here, it's more of like a crescent that's happening. Okay.
we have paresthesia. <laughs> paresthesia is that there's something abnormal with your sensation. There's something abnormal, different to the to your feelings. The best example of this is those pins and needles that you feel when you're you're pinching a nerve or pinching blood vessels going to a nerve. Uh, so you get those pins and you feel something, but it's those pins and needles. But then we can also have anesthesia. Right? Anesthesia is without sensation at all. That's pretty obvious about that. But then you could also have something called hyperesthesia, which is the sensation is much greater than what it should be. A good example is this. You probably know some people who would have a low tolerance for pain. I just tapped my wife over there. Hey, what did you just do? I'm like, I just tapped you. Why does this hurt? You know what I'm saying? So it's people with low tolerance for pain is a good example of that. Okay? <clears throat> so spinal cord injuries. Now this spinal cord injuries, I could talk, oh my goodness, I could talk on and on about this. I could do like a whole course of the spinal cord injuries. I'm cutting it down to like a measly few, few uh, um, uh, different uh, slides over here, but not so much. So I'm just cutting it down. You don't get the gist of it. But spinal cord injuries, first off, a few words over here you should, you should know. Paraplegia is half the body. Make sure you understand what that means. Half the body could be left and right, or it could be lower legs and upper arms, right? In paraplegia, they're talking about upper and lower part of the body, not left and right. That's what we call hemiplegia, which we'll talk about. Paraplegia is that the lower legs, the legs themselves, don't move, okay? Um, quadriplegia, that's what Christopher Reeve had, right? He fell off his horse, cracked his vertebrae, that he like C2. And what happened was everything from C2 all the way down, arms and legs, he can't move. Okay? <coughs> and then we talked about flaccid or spastic paralysis. Flaccid, remember, it's just like this, right? Or it's spastic, it's like this. There's contractures there. You can't really, not that there's movement, but it's just that it's curled. You can't really move the, the hand, it's, it's contracted. Okay? So again, if you have an injury here, then it's going to be the lower legs over here, right? If you have an injury much higher, it's going to be both arms and both legs. Just, and I'm not going to talk about it, but just think about it. There's no, there's no spinal cord injury that would allow you to move your legs, but you can't, but, but you can't move your arms. It's, does that make sense? Think about it. You can't do that, okay? It's the way our body's put. <coughs> and a little thing about Christopher Reeve <coughs> on there. Again, level of C2 